everyone. I'm Jesse Lovasco, and I'm a writer, poet, and artist. I um, lived in Vermont for about 20 years and then moved to Michigan for the last three years. But in that time, um, I published a book called Native. And most of the poems really come from my experience in Vermont in living in nature and walking the woods. And um, I'm here to share it with you today. And next to me, I have... Hi, my name is Sean Dennis, and I'll be reading from Crosscut today, which is a, a memoir and poems about my time as a trail builder with the Northwest Youth Corps. And uh, when Jesse was living in Vermont and moving to Michigan, I was reversing that. I used to live in Michigan for six years and then moved here back in 2012. And I'm so excited to read poems with you. So great. Well, I'm going to start with my very first poem. It's called Holding the Bow. And it's basically an observation from looking at the way um, Native peoples might look at culture and how they treat people. And this is, the, this is the poem, Holding the Bow. Indigenous ones, those who warm their hands in earth, know the cycle of moon and stories of constellations. Those who nourish each other with plants, ecstatic dance and sacred rituals who guide their children to know nature, lead rites of passage with communities of trust. These are the ones to lead us. Their ways uphold tools for navigating a life well lived on this earth. Food, shelter, warmth, clothes, medicine, and honoring their people. Instead of the illusionary arrows of our bows, aiming farther away from the origin of what nurtures humanity. That was a wonderful poem, Jesse. I love it. And so much of what you're talking about fits right in with what I'm talking about in Crosscut, so I could read a, a variety of poems. And I just love so many of the images. I'm going to start with the opening uh, poem, which is called Balance Point. This actually takes place in Michigan. And... Uh, just to give you a tiny bit of background, this is uh, about me thinking about when I used to be a trail builder. Balance point. I discover a Pulaski, a trail tool I haven't cradled in a dozen years, leaned under the eaves of this civilian conservation core cabin that has been converted into a writing residency. I bear this cutting tool into a nearby meadow of quavering lilies and irises, and I find its balance point. At a dead and down, I raise the axe edge above my head and drive hips and shoulders into the swing, feeling metal sliver air before blade chaws into pine. Fists of bark and sapwood leap like spawning sockeye salmon surging upriver. I swing again and again, showering this meadow and trees raised, realizing so many things have changed these years. But some things remain, though hidden, in our fibers of muscle, remembering and always ready. The tool <laughs> and what and what it is used for and what we have forgotten. It's that was beautiful. Thank you. Um, the next one I'm going to read is called In the Wildwood. And this is kind of coming from Michigan in the suburbs and not really knowing the forest and you know. Uh, Little Red Riding Hood stories when I was a kid and not really knowing but longing for it and and what I discovered in the wildwood. First time alone in a forest, demons stirred my thinking, left me trembling, frightened, wanting to run, distracting me from hundreds of leaf and stone altars made by wind, rain, and cold. Slowing down my steps, rhythms of earth and pulse breathed into leaves exchanged with trees. I felt my breath. I noticed lichen-covered tree stumps that looked like small castles, heard an ethereal echo from a distant bird. I felt welcome with a pull from each being awaiting my approach. Now when I enter, leaves are weaved in my hair, petals of wild rose surround my heart, seed pods dangle down my chest. I've become kindred with the woods, sitting on a branch, resting in a nest, married to the wilderness. I love that. I, again, your poems are beautiful and I could settle on a, a few. I'm going to read one called Boulder Creek, 
And it's kind of getting at that same idea, of just really studying a single moment. It's not my first moment, but it's early on my days as a trail crew, build, trail crew builder. This is called Boulder Creek. Close your eyes a moment and then open them to that babbling creek. What is its name? Maybe Boulder Creek or Rattlestone or some name so beautiful you long to hold it in your mouth. Run your tongue across the sound. Hush its name back into the full moon breeze. Let the creek course its way toward the North Umpqua River. This moment, I learned life is too big to hold. It is only something to be tasted, savoring. Again, it's that tactile connection and being able to be in it. And yeah, they both come from the same essence. It's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read one call. Well, living in Vermont, I have found my tribe. And uh, my children gifted me to um, a herb conference because I got very interested in herbalism while I was in and studied um, while I was in Vermont. But when I got to Michigan, they, they treated me to an herb conference. And so there I found many people that were similar to me. And so I, into my, into my um, values. So finding my tribe. It is not enough to honor the wind or watch clouds reimagine themselves in the sky. One needs others to share stories, so they spread like roots holding the earth. Traveling miles over rolling dirt roads, I found women, women circled around fire. Rue Olympia, tree resin smoke, pine and cedar infused water, an indigenous ritual song. Voices wafted on wind trails glazed over a lake and echoed back like loon calls over land. We held hands, drank tea, and offered prayers. Then dispersed like floating ashes into stars, each to our own territory. Some dark night as they sing, I'll recognize their shadows on the moon. I love that ending, floating, floating ashes to stars. And uh, so I'm gonna read a poem. You were talking about finding your tribe and uh, when you work in the woods with a trail crew, you don't know who you're going to end up working with. And, and one day at the beginning of the season, your boss gives you six to 10 uh, youth, 16 to 19 year olds, and that becomes your tribe for six to 10 weeks. So I'm going to read a poem about getting that trail crew for the first time ever. It's called Trail Crew. Day one, I drive this new crew of teens south on Oregon's I-5 toward the poison oak infested Cascade Range. Six teens paid hourly slump in the row seats of our shimmering white van. Apathetic faces gaze at blurred fine furs as we abandon Eugene for spring and summer intense. When we return, April flowers will be replaced by September leaves. In the rear view, I scan faces trying to tease out their histories. Today, I can only guess. And for the first time, crew leader, it can't get worse. Strings, a, her a homeless heroin dabbler who plays guitar like songbirds sing. Serious hook on pot and breaking into houses to get money to smoke himself away. Red, a shy, red-haired McDonald's assistant manager, one of only two women on our crew, along with Stacy, a meth addict who will be here so few days, we never know her myths. Boone, recently out of alcohol rehab, wears wavy black hair and a ponytail like Shiloh, except Shiloh sports a smiley face wound ear to Adam's apple to ear a week old and scabbed from when someone tried to saw his head off. The seven of us today, strangers, will spend months building trails, returning to, primi to primitive. Today, tomorrow, in the five months ahead, I will learn this group the way rock learns erosion incrementally. Wow. <laughs> the description is incredible of each one of those people. That was really beautiful. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> uh, we have not heard each other's poems. This is all new to us, too. Um, I'm the oldest of 10 children, and so to, in order to get to write as a child, because it was in me very young, I had to really um, find a way to get away. So this is called Horse. Silence was wilderness in a house of many children. I ran like a wild horse with the sound of ocean waves crashing against the shore. 
I locked my bedroom door and sat in my closet writing. Pen and paper, my bow and arrow, I was inspired by the only landscape I knew, the open page. Found myself bareback, exuberant, galloping over the inner worlds of thought, shaping them into words on paper, gathering them into a corral of poems. I love that. And uh, I love this idea that you had words in you from when you were a kid. I love to read, but I don't know that anyone would have ever said that I would become a writer. Actually, I think a lot of people would have said I would not become a writer. So <laughs> I'm jealous of you for having words that young. Uh, and really, I started writing more or less when I was working in the woods. I wrote journals when I was younger, but they were terrible. And, uh, and then in the woods, when I had a free moment, like you, uh, I would write, and rather than having nine siblings i had 10 crew members and they took up all of my time but uh once every two weeks you get a day off and often it would be in the woods and uh you go to a town or get a hotel or get a meal so you just hike off into the woods find a spot to throw your sleeping bag down and spend the day alone uh and that's when i would do my writing and this is a poem about about one of those days it's called day of rest at dusk, a first coyote serenades waning Venus as she kisses these Cascade Mountains before her early slumber. Two ravens, the color of this evening tide sky, crawl to the faithful as if for an evening prayer. Today, my crew is in someone else's calloused hands. No cloud of dust from the trail of the clouds, no members trying to quit before tool count, no shoulders tight from the bulk of the pick ads. Instead, today, even the Roosevelt elk fed down in sun-dappled fields of yarrow. Wonderful. I'm like, I love how you end it like that. Thanks. It's beautiful. And to have the time and to find the time amidst, amidst it all. It's really beautiful. And it's so great we share that. Maybe all writers do, you know, in some way, having to find it amidst all the chaos of their lives, find places of quiet or time. Um, okay. This next one is, um, okay, this is called Meeting Nature, and it's actually about my grandmother and I, and the type of world I was exposed to, um, living in the suburbs, my grandma was single, she was a widow, I should say, um, and she would take me shopping, and I didn't really know what like children of Vermont knew, <laughs> I found. <laughs> Meeting nature. If my grandmother taught me to climb a mountain, earth would have known me long before now. I may have known ephemerals, trillium and lady slippers, countless lichen growing on trees. Instead, she took my hand and walked to the village of department stores. She wore high-heeled shoes and a navy blue purse, and I wore patent leathers. She never knew the mountains, forest, or rivers. She was raised in a brick house on a cement street, ironing clothes in Detroit. Today, I took my grandsons to Moss Glen Falls with a picnic lunch. We sat at the edge watching the water cascade into eddies and pools. They each tucked a couple of rocks in their pockets and wanted to sleep under the stars. I would think all humans would seek the woods spontaneously, be summoned by the rustling trees and humming water. I guess our senses can actually grow numb or sleep through a lifetime as nature shares her wonder. Perhaps each child must be taken by the hand led into the wilderness with someone who cares about them, someone who creates a meeting, one that introduces the soul to the land. Another, I'm trying to keep some of the words in, in my head so I can share back, but uh, you know, leading a child out into the wilderness, uh, just such a beautiful idea. I, I grew up on Long Island, but every summer and most every single break, we would go to Pennsylvania and, and spend time in a remote uh, cabin that had electricity, but really no heat and no running water. And that was my introduction. Uh, so I was lucky enough to have some of that suburbia, but more than, not more than eight. That was the powerful stuff. 
Uh, but I want to read a poem uh, about maybe the exact opposite. And this is where after a season in the woods, it's all coming to a close and I've got to go back to society. So you start out in society and then go into the woods and, and, uh, and I'll reverse it. This is a poem called Tomorrow. On the edge of the wilderness, two tracks wend to pavement, then to scattered houses that bleed into subdivisions of repetition that bloom into just 40 miles from camp, Seattle, Everett, and Bellingham, sprawl so close to girdling us, a tangled web masticizing skyscrapers that fail to imitate mountains that we love. You can have it all. <laughs> wow. Mary, it was a perfect opposite. It was great. Wow. That was really something. Um, I loved that. So now you're in Vermont and I'm here in Michigan. Yes. <laughs> and I'm longing to be back there. Oh, goodness. Just hearing Come that. home. That's where I live. No, it's <laughs> um, Okay, the next one is just a simple contemplation on a rock. Questions about a rock. This rock is part of a wall surrounding a stone tower. Shall I sit on it, scrape the flowering carpet, or bend down close? See how many small forests it has fostered in this miniature world. Perhaps they are stars and this rock is a planet. Shall I look for the moon? How many ways does creation tell its story? How many things die before they are known? Oh, I love that. Thank you. How many things die before they are known? All right. So do I know that stone tower? Is that a stone tower in Vermont? It's Hubbard Park. I was wondering about that. <laughs> All right, I don't know if this is a, an exact, I feel like a lot of our other poems, at least in my mind, you would read something, I'd say, oh, I know exactly what the poem I want to read to. Uh, but here's just a, maybe a quiet meditation like yours, um, a short little poem called Between. Night air still as a pause breath, final weeks become space between the beating of a heart and the next beating. That's perfect for right now, for what we're all going through. The space between being, is that what you said? Uh, five weeks become space between the beating of a heart and the next beating. That's so perfect for today and what we're all experiencing. Yeah. Um, we haven't, go ahead. Well, I'm just thinking we haven't even talked about any of that, but uh, I'm so thankful to be reading with you, even if it's uh, via voice chatting or video chatting, sorry. I, I agree. This is just wonderful that Kellogg Hubbard was able to do um, the Zoom and make us, allow us all and make it an opportunity for listeners to hear us reading in um, for Poem City. But the crisis is huge, and yet each one of us can foster something in ourselves maybe that we haven't. So it's an opportunity for us if we're not in the bleak darkness of it and, and are, are obeying the rules of being at home. Maybe we can do something even with our children or you know, our, our arts, our crafts, whatever. Well, my wife just uh, packed a lunch and we walk, we live in the woods and we have a little trail that leads to, uh, we live on a lake, but. Uh, we went down into the marsh that's near our house, and my three-year-old daughter and my wife and I, uh, we all packed a little lunch and sat outside on the snow and ice and just enjoyed it. Uh, it's those little things that maybe you wouldn't do on a normal day. You'd get in your car and go visit friends or go to the store. So it's uh, wonderful to find the joys in the, in, the, in the sickness. Yeah, yes, yes. I agree. Shall we keep reading, or shall we... What do you think? Maybe two or three more poems? Okay, okay. Um, let's see. This, story. this is interesting. <laughs> I 
met someone who told me a story about his grandmother. And this was in Michigan at a restaurant. And I just was just so blown away by the story that I had to write a poem about it. And it's called A Cry in the Woods. This is about his grandmother, who is the child in the story, in this poem. It's, I'm sorry. I take that back. It's not his grandmother, it's his grandfather. Okay. He held his mother's hand, walking through high grass into the wood, his legs feathered by soft green wands holding seed. She looked at the sky and breathed heavily like winds that blew in clouds. They crossed undulating blankets of woodland debris. She teetered deeper into darker shades of trees. She heard a sound he could not hear. A baby crying, beckoning her near. She told him to stay until she returned. Her skirts faded into shadows. He sat against an oak entrusted over him, still waiting, listening to small creatures, birds quieting. After a long time, he heard rustling. She came lumbering towards him, holding an infant, whimpering near her breast like a lamb. She placed the small one in his arms. He inhaled a sweet earthy scent, touched a soft crown of hair atop her head. His eyes burned with tears. Mother said, this is your sister. So if you didn't get what I just read, this really is about a mother who didn't have a doula or a midwife, had to birth her child in the woods, took him by the hand and said, stay by this oak tree. You have to stay right here. And she went in the forest and birthed her, child, her, her daughter. That, that is incredible. I think about uh, my wife and daughter's journey and uh, how much assistance we got and just the idea of bringing my daughter to the woods and saying, stay here while I go have a baby and I'll be back in an hour or 10 hours. Right. It could be a long time. Right. Yeah. Well, on my trail, we were lucky enough to have no kids being born while on there. And uh, <laughs> so I don't have any poems that go along with any of that. Um, so this is one where I'm just going to choose a poem that to at least me talk to it and maybe uh, the feel of being out in the woods at that that time being alone and um, this is just a poem about being in the woods early in the morning because we'd go to work five in the morning and we'd be walking through the woods at uh at dawn it's called another kind of light during, during dawn's first grasp i search towards where i should glimpse rugged cascades all i see are skeletal fingers breaking from dark earth returning the sun its initial light oh to be a willow beating back the bruise of night. I love your tactile descriptions. They're so strong, they're beautiful. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna go for another one here. Um, acorn, and it is shaped like an acorn. <laughs> It takes a life of experience and adversity to understand that who we are is not defined by where we live, what we do, who we love, what we wear and how we act. When we discover the golden acorn of our being, we can finally say, I am who I am. That's great. It's, I love the beautiful shape of it. Um, when my daughter was unborn, we called her acorn. I can't remember why we decided on that versus anything else, but uh, the trail that we were just hiking on was called Acorn Trail. So I'm thinking about all those things. And, uh, and I'll read a, a poem that I think is similar. It's, uh, if you've never read Gilgamesh, it's the oldest known written story. So it's the first story that was ever written down that we know of. And uh, it, it's about Gilgamesh and, uh, his, in, at, er, earlier in the book, his nemesis, Enkidu. And Enkidu is this wild beast of a man and, uh, who loses his power. And uh, it's about that idea of, of maybe, you know, I'm thinking about you of yeah. knowing or Acorn knowing who you are, having that in your being. 
So it's called Becoming Enkidu, Losing Enkidu. After months constructing trails, digging society from our bones, this crew has transformed into Enkidu, for he loved Shamha. When he spoke the language of those who ate grass and drank from water holes, at our end, I fear Enkidu's spirit deserts us. Each of us soon exiled as Enkidu was. Too soon we return to the rule of ruining cities, no longer home beside bear and elk, no longer drinking from crystal and creeks. Mm, mm, mm. Beautiful. Wow. Yeah, who we are. And again, this is the time that we all can, like you took your, your child, is a daughter? Daughter. Yes, to, into the woods. And it's a great time to ask yourself those questions. You know, who, who I am in amidst all of this. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't sure how long we were going to go. So I'm just going to find one. Okay. When my daughter had a baby, I was able to be there with her. And, um, it was one of the most beautiful things I ever saw and learned something about my daughter in that. A blessing. Once the rhythms of my daughter's body confirmed movement toward birth, I gathered my thoughts like best friends and sat with a candle on the floor. In silence beneath the sky of stars, I recalled the laboring of my mother, as spirits of my grandmothers to be with her, surround her as water is around fish as bark wraps around the rings of trees. Only a woman who bore, a wise one in the wild ocean of birth, knows that one must let go, yield to the threshold between worlds, accept like water, a blessing. Oh, that was stunning. Thank you. And it doesn't describe, I have some poems that really describe the birthing, but this one was something that I decided to put in this collection because it spoke to many versus just her individual experience. And uh, can you read that line again? Yield to? Um, yield to the threshold between worlds. Accept like water, a blessing. Oh, I love that. Like, wa like you accept water, a blessing. Yeah. If I was going to read uh, someone else's poem, I'd read James White's poem, A Blessing. Uh, oh, yes. Beautiful poem. Yes. And should, should this be my last poem and, uh, or more? Probably. I think, you know, um, I think this is perfect that we, we did. We got to do some from each, and I think it's good. Yeah. So as you were reading, I was thinking about that connection uh, between us and the world. And this is a poem about that connection, uh, but through, uh, through work. It's called Distance. I never wear my elk skin gloves because I want no distance between Glory Peak and me. Nothing separating these cracked fingernails and scabbed fingers from loam, dirt, and duff. No space between the heft of a hog hoe and my calloused hands because the straight grain ash polished by the sweat and oil of these palms transforms the hoe from mere tool to an ex exact extension of my trail weary arms. John, I love how many ways you describe your hands, the, the cuts and the fingers and the palms and the dirt and the, it's like you can totally, in the movement, you can totally just be in the dirt and what a great way to and in the dirt, in the earth, because it's the one thing that we, we have that we can nurture and it nurtures us. Yes. Yeah, so. I, I agree. And I'm so lucky that uh, during this time, my family and I can escape out. I think about that all the time, how so many people are in urban areas and they don't have any dirt to get their hands into. They don't have any trees to lean into and smell. And I know that we are so thankful. Uh, to have that escape day. Yeah, it, it's, that is a blessing in every way, in every way to have that. And knowing more now, just being here and not having access at my, you know, out the door or even a drive away. It's a quite a drive away 
to get into forest area here. So I'm so grateful that we got to do this together. This was wonderful. I hope we can do it again actually sometime that would be great and thank you to kellogg hubbard library and to sean and and jesse i thank you so much for organizing this figuring it all out uh inviting me to participate and i hope the next time we do this it's in person with a a, a wild variety of people out there and we can get into some great discussions face to face about the beauty of the wilds and then humanity but thank you so much thank you thank you